Hello from Vienna and welcome to this live interview with International Atomic Energy Agency Director General Rafael Grossi, who joins me from just across the Danube, IAEA headquarters. DG, hello. Indeed, um, good afternoon, uh, we should say, uh, Vienna time. It's a pleasure to be, uh, to be with you on this uh, cold but uh, sunny morning here in Vienna. Yes, it's a shame. I actually have, I have a beautiful view of the Imperial Palace to my left, but we can't show it to you because there's all <laughs> kinds of backlighting and it's a, it's a shame we can't see it. But anyway, um, uh, it's, a, it's a real a pleasure to be able to speak to you for this. Actually, the second time in a month we had an interview uh, not, not so long ago, DG. So um, uh, this is a chance for us to follow up on some of the things we discussed and also deal with um, uh, some other issues that have, have come up in the meantime. You actually did me uh, a favor earlier today by uh, posting a video on Twitter of the many, many things that you have um, yes. to deal with uh, in, in the year ahead. You know, we often refer to your agency, you know, as a shorthand as the UN nuclear watchdog, which of course it is. Um, and uh, everyone knows your agency for its work with nuclear inspections and what's known as technically in the jargon as safeguards work, uh, particularly in Iran, where you are policing the, uh, the, the JCPOAs, the nuclear deal with, with major powers. But that is just a small part of, of, of your agency's work, a very important part, uh, of course. Uh, but your agency's slogan is uh, Atoms for Peace and Development, which was uh, modified under your predecessor, Yuki Yamana. Um, and so I just wanted to, you know, this video that you posted online, uh, it's actually, it's just two minutes, it's actually quite exhausting, sort of getting through the the many things that you have uh, that you have to deal with, just as a quick break, just, just a summary of the words you you touched on. You know, you have safeguards, as we mentioned, in Iran, preparing preparing for a possible return to North Korea, nuclear safety ten years after the Fukushima Daiichi um, accident, um, nuclear security, uh, what's known as nuclear applications, so issues like water management, food security, nuclear medicine, women's cancers. Um, and then also uh, COP26 in Glasgow. So touching on the environment is another issue that's been very uh, mentioned quite a bit so far uh, at Reuters Next. But then also um, touching on COVID, which has been another important theme uh, of these discussions so far, is one of your, uh, your possibly your flagship project at the moment, uh, known as Zodiac, dealing with diseases like um, COVID, which are so-called zoonotic diseases. You know, yes. Um, jump from humans to, to animals. Perhaps you could tell us a little more about um, what yeah, you're planning there. Indeed, indeed, Francois. It's, it's uh, li like you said, um, uh, this agency uh, does a lot in, in, in different areas, and it's good to remind people uh, of, of that, because I suppose that in an exercise like the one we are having today and, and Reuters is conducting of uh, looking at uh, what people is doing around the world and, 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 and different uh, leaders are doing around the world, uh, th this agency is uh, busy with, with uh, a number of issues that have to do with, uh, with, the, uh, with the welfare and with the improvement of life conditions of uh, people out there. Apart from the, 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 the hot political issues that we discuss normally with you and your colleagues, and we are going to be discussing in a few minutes, I'm sure, um, about uh, non-proliferation situations, it is important that, that uh, people know that we are also part of the efforts um, that are being carried out um, worldwide uh, on, a, on a number of fronts. Let, let us put them li like that. And of course, first, comes to mind is the pandemic and what's happening and and here the agency has been helping is helping uh, many countries in you know by providing rt pcrs that are based on nuclear technology these are the you know the the uh, the, the, the machines that allow us to go to a, an, a, an a easier and faster um, uh, diagnosis of of um, of a disease, in this case, um, the uh, COVID-19. And we are also, uh, by way of uh, using the nuclear techniques that allow to work on zoonosis, these are the, um, the um, uh, um, situations that go from the animal uh, to the human um, in terms of uh, health. Uh, illnesses and bacteria and, and, and uh, viruses and other things. Uh, we have put together 
a program uh, with 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 an with a catchy um, um, acronym uh, Zodiac, which uh, stands for Zoonotic Disease Integrated Action. So it means that we are bringing together all these capacities and helping veterinary labs and other institutions in many countries um, from our site, from the nuclear if you want site. There are the efforts, of course, carried out by WHO and, uh, and other inter sister international organizations, and of course, uh, every country. And, and this is a very important part of our effort uh, that, that we are trying to put uh, together for the benefit of, of countries. But we also work, as you, as you mentioned, on, on nuclear medicine, radiotherapy. We are very active in, in the area of uh, women cancer, in particular in developing countries. Uh, where there are incredible situations where uh, not a single radiotherapy machine or unit is, exists in, in many countries. So what is, which is of course unthinkable at this um, day and age, but it, ha it happens. So the IEA is, is working on, on that one. It's also a busy year. It's the, it's, it's the year of COP26 in Glasgow as you know, where people are going to be tackling the, the, the um, climate change uh, issue. And of course, for us, from our perspective, uh, nuclear, which is a clean, uh, dispatchable um, source of uh, energy, is, uh, is and can be part of the solution to that. So as you can see, um, in the new year, uh, the IEA is trying to be as, as useful as we can be on behalf of our member states. We are providing a service as, as, as we should, according to our mission. It's also the interesting, uh, an interesting aspect of your of your mandate uh, in that the statute, the IAEA statute, says that you, a central part of your role is to encourage the peaceful uses of, of nuclear energy and essentially encourage the, the spread of nuclear energy. But in this case now, you're faced with many developed countries actually reducing their, their share of nuclear energy in their mix. And you have said that you're also going to be helping those countries you know, do that because that yeah. also a certain level of... That is very interesting because in reality what we see in the world is that there is an increase of the use of nuclear energy, not a decrease. So uh, here I think it's very important to have opportunities like this because there's a narrative or an impression out there that there is a reduction in nuclear energy. And here in Western Europe, even here in Western Europe, there's still uh, a good number of countries that are uh, using uh, nuclear energy in a, a large scale. There are also very important countries that have reduced or decided to phase out the nuclear energy. But in, in a larger context, when you look at the emerging South and, or you look at China, you look at Russia, you look at the United States uh, and other places, nuclear energy is not going down, it's going up. So um, I think it's a good to, to, to stick to the facts and to try to show what that is. That being said, we are not nuclear lobbyists. What we are doing is making sure that uh, the countries that are using nuclear energy um, do it in a safe and secure way and that all countries have access to the technologies, especially developing countries. As you know, there we have a promotional uh, side to it. You, you should remember that. And today perhaps is a good day. Today is the 75th anniversary of the first session of the General Assembly of the United Nations. And one of the, in London, uh, and, and one of the first um, uh, agencies um, that was created was the IAEA in 1957 already. And, and the, in the first set of resolutions for those who are interested in history, they will see that um, atomic energy, nuclear energy was part of that. Of course, it was the, the, the end of the Second World War and people saw this as an emerging uh, factor. So I don't want to get into too much into history, but to say that, that it's a reality. It's something that is, um, is there to improve the life of people, which is basically what we all want, whatever we do. Um. Yes, and it's uh, it's true that that you know is the more overlooked side of, of what the agency does. And it was mentioned when uh, when the when the IAEA won the Nobel Peace Prize in two thousand five. That was mentioned by the, the Nobel Committee, but the the the, the 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 thrust of the reason the agency uh, was was given the Nobel Peace Prize uh, was because of its work in Iran at the time, and uh, and Iran is is still with us. Um, and we were uh, we were both um, sucked into Iran on New Year, just on New Year's Day. Since we're talking about a new year, um, you know, yes. uh, Iran has kept us busy uh, a lot of the time. Uh, and so, uh, even since the last time we spoke, we're faced with new developments, new facts on the ground um, in Iran. Um, and 
and your report um, that was issued to member states on the on New Year's Day said that Iran had told you that they plan to enrich uranium to a higher level than they have at any point since the, their deal, since the JCPOA um, went into force. And only a few days later, you confirmed that they have begun this process of enriching uranium to 20%. It's their declared target. Um, the level, the highest level they've reached since the deal we went into force in 2016. Uh, is 4.5%. Uh, and your report was quite quite specific in this, and it says that they started at 4.1% at Fordo, this site dug into a mountain. Um, so how how rapidly are they progressing? Have they gone over the 4.5% yet? Well, uh, quite rapidly, I would say. Um, as you were uh, mentioning on, on, on the 31st of December, they, they told us um, that they were planning uh, to do this. We didn't know whether this was just an intention or or an actual uh, decision to move into this. A, a, year, uh, a, a couple of days uh, later, they indicated that they were proceeding with uh, the start of the process. And so uh, there were a number of technicalities. We're not going to annoy your, the audience here with that, that we had to perform in terms of adjusting the work of our inspectors, send our inspectors to the place. And they started feeding, putting into the, into the cascades in which, uh, through which the centrifuges that enrich the material are organized. Um, uh, UF6 and the process uh, indeed um, started. So, uh, yes, we are in a new reality because, as you rightly say, um, we are under the conditions of an agreement. They are under the conditions of an agreement, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action signed in 2015, and which indicates that Iran should be enriching only up to 3.67 the uranium they have. We, we know that as a, as a, as a result of the um, sort of tit-for-tat tit logic that, that came um, into play when the United States announced its withdrawal from the, the agreement, they were reaching at a higher level, but um, the, um, the, uh, the difference was not as, as big. The delta was uh, simply to show that they were above the, the agreed uh, limitation. Now, 20% is a different thing, of course. It's a much higher uh, degree that requires important changes in the, in the operation and, of course, attracts a lot more attention uh, internationally uh, because of the correlation that exists with between the enrichment of uranium and the um, ability to get to, to levels that are potentially of military use. Right, but so my question, DG, was how quickly they have advanced from 4.1% in, in the time since you since you mentioned. So are we looking at, uh, you know, first of all, are we have they gone over 4.5% already? Uh, how soon can we expect them to get in the vicinity of 20%? Can you give us any sense of well, the, how the, they're progressing? The, the process uh, has uh, started and we have to see um, each day how much they can produce. With, with this installed set of cascades, we are talking uh, about uh, a few kilograms per month, uh, but this could, uh, could increase. Uh, I cannot tell you a figure now, not because it's a secret, it's because they have just uh, started. Uh, but if we project, if we were to project the uh, estimated volumes of production against the capacity of the machines there, we are talking about something like that, 10 or a little bit more uh, per month. It sounds like you're saying it's too soon to say how how quickly we're going to we're at, we're going up in terms of enrichment purity. We, are, we can estimate that they are going to be at, the, at that level with that with that installed capacity. They could decide to add more. Um, uh, if you allow me to add another layer to the discussion, you maybe recall that this is in um, answer or answering or in compliance with a law that was passed right. by the Mahlis, by the Iranian parliament which um, uh, already in the month of December, early December, uh, um, uh, mandated uh, the government, the executive, to take a number of actions in different areas of the nuclear activity. Yes. One of those was to, uh, to enrich and to at uh, 20% and to have uh, a, 
a volume of uh, uranium at 20% uh, in storage and among other things. So I suppose this is the beginning of this process. If it continues like this, we will see. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that because that's just one element of the, what is in that, that law, right? And so there's another interesting aspect. So I have it printed out here. Um, it says that two months after the enactment of the law, which was in December, um, they will stop allowing inspectors inspections beyond the safeguards agreement, which is to cut through the jargon here, uh, part of the JCPOA, the deal with, with major powers, is that they're enforcing what's called the additional protocol, which gives your agency the power to carry out SNAP inspections at sites that are not declared to the agency, uh, a power that you've used uh, quite a lot. Uh, you've carried out quite a, quite a few inspections. Um, and, and so that, that would mean that they would stop granting you SNAP inspections and the like um, by February. Uh, is, that, is that something you... Is that something you take seriously or do you see here this a more piecemeal? Well, I, must, I must take it seriously. I must take it seriously because it's a law and uh, the, uh, the government uh, seems to be intent in complying. Even with, with that aspect then on, on not, allowing, not allowing anything beyond the safeguards agreement then? Well, uh, by it's part of the law and I cannot um, um, ascertain or, or speculate into whether the, the government is planning to implement the law in full or partially. Well, but that's the interesting thing, though, because you issued a report on the 1st of January saying that you had been informed about one part of that law, what was happening at Fordo. So does that mean that you haven't been informed? Uh, you have no indication that they're going to, to do what they say about inspection, well, so inspections? Far we, so far, we haven't, uh, we haven't this particular indication. Um, but uh, this is a new situation in so far as we've never been confronted with a comprehensive law and, and, uh, and the government um, uh, informs us um, uh, piecemeal <laughs> um, uh, whether they are going to be. So I cannot, I cannot have a pattern or a background. Um, what I can tell you is that we are in constant dialogue well, with the um, Atomic Energy Agency of, of Iran and with the Foreign Ministry. Uh, I think it's a constructive dialogue that we are having so far. I hope this will be the case and we will continue um, uh, in, this, in this way. Of course, all of these things take place against the background of bigger or, or, the, or the wider political developments ongoing. And I suppose that they are also connected with this reality. But if you ask me um, whether we have been informed of an impending um, suspension of uh, our inspectors' activities, uh, no, but they are in the law. But these provisions are in the law. So when you ask me, do you take it seriously? I take it seriously and I'm concerned. Good. That's, that's clear. Thank you. Because, as you say, this does tie into something broader, which is the arrival of a new US administration. The last time we spoke, um, you said in terms of the overall, Iran's overall activities, nuclear activities, you know, what I see is that we're moving full circle back to December 2015. December 2015, it was just before the deal was essentially put into effect. Um, now, uh, and since then, we've had this new declaration on, on Fordo, which is even an extra layer because they weren't enriching to 20%. They did enrich to 20% before the deal, but they weren't doing that uh, in December 2015. So um, this was, you said this in the context of uh, having to reach some kind of ancillary agreement to the, to the deal in terms of saying, you know, how do we put the toothpaste back in the tube if, if and when Iran decides to come back into full compliance? bearing in mind that their breaches were done in response to the US withdrawal. Um, but so my question to you is, uh, you didn't give a time frame saying, you know, what you see is we're moving full circle back to December 2015, um, but it does seem like we're moving increasingly fast. Do you see a, a window for, for talks here? Is there a do you, well, do, yes, yeah, What's your view on the time frame for getting something done as a kind of agreement here? Well, there's always a window for talks. Um, I'm a diplomat and I believe, uh, you know, very sincerely uh, and, and very honestly in, uh, in this. So uh, I think we, 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 we must have uh, and find a, a way from our perspective, of course, uh, we are the uh, inspectors. We are the ones um, 
monitoring and policing uh, agreements that are um, made uh, by uh, politicians um, on, on both sides, if we talk about sides here. I, I, I know, we, we all know, there have been statements on almost every side of, of the agreement, so uh, we are um, expecting um, th th these people to sit uh, around the table uh, and we are going to uh, contribute uh, to that, not as a party, but as the technical uh, supervisor of all of this. And when you were referring to um, our past conversations about uh, how we go back to the uh, agreement in its initial form or shape, what I was saying has been proven by the subsequent facts. Uh, it is obvious that, uh, uh, that the situation on the ground had changed and is changing and is going to change even more. So there will have to be some clear understanding on how uh, the initial terms uh, or the initial provisions of the JCPOA, if it's so decided by the political uh, parties to that, um, it are, is going to be are going to be recomplied with. Like you were saying, putting the, the toothpaste back in the tube. I hope this is going to be easier than that operation. I'm trying to figure out myself how you would do that. Um, I hope that in this case, it would, be, it would be a bit easier than that. But there are many, many different aspects ranging from the, the, the material, the actual material that you are going to have now at 20%. Uh, you have at 4%, you have at a little bit more, you have now uh, uh, another, band, another, another uh, you know, volume, another package at, at 20%. We will see, depending on where they get there politically, what happens, ship out or not, down blending or not, then the, the, you have the machines. And so you have all of these elements that we are going to have to uh, deal with to make it credible. Otherwise, of course, oh, it doesn't make any a, sense. I realize, you know, I, I'm, I realize I'm putting you in a, in, a, in a difficult position, which you're often in because, you know, your agency describes itself as mainly technical and there is a political role, but it's hard for you to advance in it. So what you're saying is that you don't really, you don't want to say that there is a particular window of opportunity um, imposed by this law or that there's any particular time by which a deal needs to be reached. Well, I wouldn't say that. Uh, you mentioned the, the, this date in, in, in February. So I wouldn't like to be to to receive a communication saying that uh, because of the, the deadline on the 21st of February, uh, my the presence of my inspectors in Iran is going to be reduced. That would be bad news, certainly. So um, uh, within that, uh, it's not for me to tell the president of the United States uh, and the presidents of France and, 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 and the prime minister of the United Kingdom and, and, and China, Russia, etc., Germany, uh, what to do. Uh, but it's clear that we don't have, uh, we don't have uh, many months ahead of us. We have rather weeks. Okay, so you see, you do see, this is a deadline you take seriously and one that you would like them to stick to then, is to reach told, an agreement by the 21st of February. Otherwise, this is a law of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Okay. Um, you've also, there's a lot of, since we have a few minutes left and I don't see any questions coming up, I'm just going to jump in with some of my own, I hope you don't mind. Because um, there's still a lot of, um, well, I have one general and one more technical question for you, if I may. Uh, the, the more general one is that there's still a lot of, you managed to get uh, quite a significant deal out of the Iranians in, the, in your first trip to Tehran as director general. I should mention you've only been in office a year and it, pretty much immediately after taking office, you were faced with the first ever denial of access yeah. um, on a, under the additional protocol that we mentioned, trying to go to these two undeclared sites. Um, and you got a deal. You went there, you managed to get a deal out of them, you came back. Um, and I have to say, you know, much as I've tried, I still, don't have much information in terms of what actually happened. Um, so I understand you can't necessarily get into that, but would you have any, any advice to the incoming US administration on how to deal with the Iranians on this, on this particular issue? Well, I believe, uh, I'm not sure if, if, if I could be advising the, the new administration. What we can continue to, to, to be doing is to tell things as they are. And I think this per se is uh, invaluable for anybody 
who has a, a stake at international peace and security. And uh, what we um, were able to achieve last summer was, was important, in particular because it showed that uh, we, we can um, see eye to eye and, and understand each other um, uh, with Iran on what the agency should, should be doing. The, the situation there at that time was, was not easy um, um, because they, 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 they didn't want us to uh, have access to, uh, to uh, a number of places. And then uh, when we explained the, the technical way in which we would be doing that, I think we could reassure them about um, the, the whole process. And so we, we were able to do that. And I think um, it is always possible when, when there is a clarity and there is goodwill or on, on, on every side. So my opinion now is that we are going to, we are confronted with a, with a difficult situation because the, quite clearly from August to, to, to now, any improvement um, in, in terms of complying with the JCPOA. So there is a clear erosion, a further er erosion, degradation of the situation, which means that there will be um, a lot of work politically, and I wouldn't, uh, you know, get into that. I have my own opinions, but it's not for me. They have to decide what they want to do. What we are going to be very clear on is on the technical situation and on the ways to um, inspect this. So to make sure that there is predictability uh, uh, for all. Sounds like you're talking. I mean, you you were saying when you mentioned how you got this deal done with the Iranians. It sounds like something very long-winded and drawn out. Do you really think it's possible to achieve the equivalent of that in the time that's needed by February the twenty-first? Then to get this ancillary deal. You've yes, I think I think I think I think we can. I think we can. If there is a clear understanding and uh, with the back end, we sh you shouldn't forget that uh, that I was not acting, um, you know, as a lone ranger. On a white horse, um, you know, uh, as flattering as that could be for my ego. No, I, I was, I was um, uh, the embodiment of the will of the the agency and the member states that were supporting the director general. Everybody believed that it was important that the access to the IAEA should never be interrupted. And I think this message is valid today. The access of the IAEA inspectors and the cooperation, if you want to put it in a, you know, in a wider way, uh, not in terms of access, so the cooperation with the IAEA is indispensable. Without that, um, and I'm talking not only about Iran, about any other country, it's very difficult to be in good terms with the international community. If you think about the countries that do not allow the presence of the IAEA, you will find one uh, which has lots of problems. So um, I don't think Iran or any other country. You're talking about North Korea, I should, I should say. I'm talking about North Korea, which did exactly what is in, you know, said or, or, or threatened by some, expelled. The, yeah, you can expel the IAEA, of course, we don't have a, uh, any, any divisions to, to cite uh, uh, some historical uh, quotations. We are an international organization, so we are an easy target. Kick us out, but we are the embodiment of international law. So it depends. Um, well, I'm afraid I, I'm afraid we're going to have to end it there um, as our time is up. But um, uh, uh, Director General Rafael Grossi, thank you very much for your time. That was, a, it was a, an interesting conversation. It was a pleasure to take part and to contribute to this very interesting series of events that you are holding. Thank you very much. Thank you, DG. Thank you.